Why don't I start? Um, welcome, um, everybody, uh, to this panel. Um, the goal of this panel is to review the last decade and think about the next decade in open hardware. Uh, my name is Aya Bader. Um, I'm the founder and former CEO of LittleBits. Um, and as I, uh, if you were in the opening talk, also one of the co-founders of the Open Hardware Summit. Um, today, we have a really exciting panel um, with us uh, to talk about the past decade and the future decade in open hardware. Uh, we have representatives from academia. We have representatives from uh, startups, from small business and from medium business, and really can talk about uh, what is the impact uh, of open hardware, both positive and negative, um, from all aspects um, of uh, of, of business and academia and really community. Um, first, I want to start by introducing our panelists. If you can um, wave when it's uh, when your name is called up. So um, first up, I have um, I'll start with Glenn Glenn Samala from Spark Fund. Uh, Glenn is the CEO of Spark Fund. Um, before joining Spark Fund, he was senior director and general manager of global business for Arrow Electronics, and so. Uh, we're very happy to have Glenn because he can bring the experience of being at Arrow and seeing really large scale hardware, but also doing it at Spark Fun in Colorado. Hi, Glenn. Uh, next up, we have, um, I'll go out of order, Leonard Edmond, um, co founder of Evil Mad Scientist Lab. Uh, Leonard's been working with open source hardware since 2007 and has been uh, the most uh, one of the most loyal Open Hardware Summit attendees also and participants since the early days. Um, and Leonard's work sits at the intersection of electronics, crafting, science, art, and education. Hi, Leonard. Um, next up, we have Christina. Um, Christina is the founder, um, is a hardware entrepreneur. Um, her background is in biochemistry, physics, engineering, uh, and has also experience in both hardware and software engineering. Um, uh, she has built multiple products, and her last current product that she's building is a Detours um, 4G uh, LTE Android version of the Circle Phone. Um, I love the tagline, a non-rectangular phone for non-rectangular people. That's visual. Welcome, Christina. Um, we also have founder and CEO of System76, uh, who's brought production of desktop systems in-house. Uh, System76 is the only computer manufacturer in the US, so that'll be really interesting to talk about as well. Um, hi, Carl. And I think we don't have Nadia yet. Um, I will introduce her uh, as she jumps on. But um, why don't I kind of get started? So. Um, I think uh, for me, when I thought about sort of overview of the past decade and the future decade in open hardware, um, I thought what would be really relevant is to be sort of very open and honest with the community about some of the trials and tribulations that we've been through in the past decade, but also some of the magic that we want to carry forward. Um, I know a little bit we embarked on a, being a fully open source hardware co company uh, and when we launched the first three years, it was a huge part of investment that uh, we did. And uh, and at some point, we had to deprioritize that investment because of its impact on uh, business, on cost, on um, kind of our community um, uh, interactions. And so I have uh, know firsthand uh, this idea of having to, to sort of balance uh, realities and ideologies. And so I'd really like to invite our panelists to be... Um, really sort of open about some of the um, issues that they've uh, come across. Uh, my first question is a question for everybody. Um, so it's been 10 years in open hardware. Name one thing that you think has improved over the last 10 years and one thing that you think that went backwards over the past 10 years. Maybe I'll start with you. Leonard, I'll start with you. Sure. Uh, one of the thing that's, things that has really improved is our um, connections, uh, that there's so much more access to information. Uh, the infrastructure for open hardware has incre increased and improved just incredibly. So the, the number of connections that we have in the community is just absolutely incredible. And then one thing that has gone backwards. Um, so there's still an open question about what we do when somebody calls something open hardware and it isn't. And that becomes more and more um, prevalent as more and more people tr 
become involved in this community and take advantage of this community. So that's one thing that I think is still a thorn and even a bigger thorn because people will use the name uh, when they shouldn't. Yeah, and that's an ongoing uh, uh, project that I know Ashwa is working on. Glenn, what are your thoughts? One thing that has improved over the past 10 years, one thing that went backwards. I think, you know, from my perspective, you know, the fact that from an open source hardware perspective, it's a known, more, more of a known entity in the business community, which I think is beneficial to all of us. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges for those who aren't familiar with open source in the business community, the, the question is always automatically, how do you monetize this or how do you scale this? And I think it's really trying to get those discussions going and getting beyond the, you know, the barriers first. Um, but I just think overall in terms of um, the presence and people knowing more about the open source hardware community is good for all of us. And I think it's how do we bridge that gap um, in, the, in, the, in a bigger, broader sense with the, with the uh, business community will be, uh, uh, you know, one of the challenges that we have moving forward. Uh, but, I, but I agree with Lenore in terms of sort of defining what open source hardware means is, is going to be critical for this team um, and this community moving forward just so we could really align on what, what that operational definition is so we could tell a consistent story across the board. Um, I'm, I was uh, hoping for some, uh, uh, some um, kind of big explosive uh, scandals on what's gone backwards, but so far it's been tame. So Nadia, what, <laughs> what has improved over the past 10 years and what's gone backwards? I mean, I think almost everything has improved. Right now we have some annoying things that have to do with tariffs, lame, um, but the overall, you know, uh, I have graduate students now who tell me back when you were trying to build stuff, it was impossible for you to get parts. Um, and now you can buy, you know, extrusions, you can 3D, 3D printers are reliable. There's like all kinds of, uh, there are all kinds of different places where you can buy lots and lots and lots of parts and the marketplace for those kinds of things is really accessible now in low volume. Um, but the, I guess maybe, oh, hello, <laughs> sixth person. Um, but the, uh, yeah, I think that the difficulty there that remains, and this isn't so much something that's gotten worse, but just something that we have to deal with is like, as you have more marketplaces and different places to get parts, you have to make sure you have quality control of all of those different things. So every time you get um, like a new fastener or a new chip, you wanna make sure that it actually is going to work in the design that you have and figuring out how to do distributed quality control for open source hardware, I think is something that we still haven't really figured out. Luckily, Waz is leading the charge and making sure we have all the tools we need for the future. <laughs> Passing on the buck. Um, uh, Carl, uh, let's jump over to you. What do you think has improved over the past 10 years and what's gone backwards? You can't really hear you all that well. Yes, uh, let me uh, turn on my mic here. Can you hear me better? Yeah. Yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, I agree with uh, Glenn. I think that the exposure of open hardware um, uh, and open soft source software also helps in this and that its, uh, its adoption um, has grown so widespread that um, open hardware is a natural extension of that and companies that are producing products are, are interested in both the um, uh, leveraging the open source software in its community and open hardware seems to be a natural extension to that. Uh, as far as challenges, um, I think making our, our open source designs more useful to people is probably um, one of the largest challenges I see. When we produce open source software, it's digital, it's if it's useful to people, it is. Um, you, there's a community builds around it relatively fast. Um, we see bug reports, we see pull requests, uh, we we see things grow and move and energy around it. Since launching our Thalio product line and open source desktop product, um, the the participation uh, in the design is very very different, much much smaller than it is in the open source community. And I would attribute that both to you know, the, how young this community is, as well as to um, the difficulty with which someone can take a design and make it useful um, for themselves. So, uh, I'd, I'd love to see us, us work towards um, making maker spaces and other places where you can take these designs and, and produce them yourself um, more accessible and, and part of the community. 
Um, so we'll talk about makerspaces in a bit. That's something that Christina uh, did an overview of that I'd like to share. Uh, I'd like her to share with, with others. Um, I think it's a really good point. But let's first um, talk to Christina about what do you think has improved over the past 10 years of open hardware and what has gone backwards? So I think that, you know, definitely we've had more sharing and um, of course with the growth in makerspaces uh, that's been really encouraging um, just getting the word out there also um, get people getting people used to the idea of open source hardware i think is really important um, but uh, you know like nadia pointed out the tariffs have been a real bummer at least in our industry so yeah yeah um, that's something also that's definitely exacerbated even by the situation that we're in uh, right now. So we'll, we'll, I'll have to watch how it goes. Um, the, the, the things that are kind of common across what people talked about, community awareness, um, uh, more ability to kind of make connections uh, between people. Um, I think those are really positive things. Um, I know also that uh, in um, academia, a little bit less, but definitely in startups, small business and medium business, Open hardware is hard. It's hard to do. It's a lot of extra overhead and investment, time investment, financial investment, documentation investment, um, and uh, and it adds it adds quite a bit of overhead on on everybody's uh, workload. Uh, so the question to everybody on the panel is: Why do you still do it? What is your motivation uh, to keep making your hardware open? Whoever wants to jump in, please go ahead. For me, it's giving back to the community that gave so freely to me. So I wouldn't be here. Of loyalty. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think for, for System76, open source is just a founding principle of, the, of our purpose and our uh, what, we, what we work on. If um, For us, open source means sharing knowledge. And sharing knowledge means it's more accessible to more people. And more accessibility means people have more opportunities. If uh, you know, we've been able, if we had the opportunity to invest as a company to design um, hardware and PCBs and backplanes and things like that. Now people can take those designs, learn from them, and, and use them, adapt them, um, build their own designs off of them. I think that the real value in open source is is simply that is that knowledge can spread and it isn't locked up into institutions or companies any longer it's now everyone's knowledge so from your perspective participating in it taking on that extra overhead is a sense of duty or a sense of mission or a sense of ideology um, yes. yeah yeah um i don't uh, disagree with uh, that but i definitely don't think it is my prime motivator i i think that like reproducibility is really important being able to replicate systems i think it's hard to rely on things that you don't know how they work and if you want to be able to verify and make sure that the thing that you're telling it to do is actually doing mm -hmm. then without being able to see in it you can't you can't guarantee that people can't extend and customize things if they're not open and designed to be extensible in that way. Um, overall, I think closed systems just break. Um, don't they're not they're not robust, and they don't have the smartness of everyone um, able to figure out flaws and fix them. I want to so build on what yeah. uh, Nadia said about extensibility. That um, by making our products open, we reach different audiences because there's more documentation about it and they're, they can learn more about the product, they can do different things with it than we anticipate. So we're always learning about people using our things for ways that we had no idea that they would. We didn't expect that they would use it for, for this thing. And they only do that because it's documented well enough that they're able to repurpose it. Not only that, I mean, if I can talk about Lenora's tools, like the AxiDraw, for example, has a really robust software component that goes together with the hardware. And without being able to do like the full end-to-end -end open source system, you can't get it to do whatever the weird things are that you want it to be able to do. Um, the AxiDraw is an interesting um, uh example because part of it is not open source but part of the hardware is and it's um uh, an iterative um design that comes from an early fully open source hardware project the eggbot which um was started back in 2010 so um 
the active drive wouldn't be here without open hardware that it's it's been built on uh, this you know series of machines that um, came out of an open hardware project yeah, i mean from a smartphone perspective the easy answer is it's we are an open source hardware company that is our dna that's how we started um, i could tell you in terms of why we continue to open source it makes us a better company right i think part of part of our mission from a smartphone perspective is to really you know, do new product introductions, give access to the folks on new technologies, both software and hardware as much as we can. And, you know, from an open source perspective, it just makes us better, right? I think, you know, but it's also a challenge, quite honestly, right? I am sure you've been through this. I think it forces you to keep coming up with iterations and new products. I and mean, we, you have to keep focus on the next big thing, the next tech, you know, technology, whatever, whatever interests the community. You can't, you can't cash cow a product for a year or two. And that's okay by us because again, our mission is to, to make technology available and, and make new products available as quickly as possible. I mean, it just makes us a better company. Yeah. Honestly, from a technology- I think one demoralizing thing about that is whenever mm -hmm. you open yourself up, you also are inviting all the criticism and it really is the thing sure. that makes you better. But you know, sometimes you open up your pull requests and you're like, oh God, everybody yeah. hates me. I but, just do terrible shit. But overall, <laughs> But overall, in technology space, right, regardless if you're open or closed, the reality is the market, the technology market, rewards doesn't reward sort of the status quo, doesn't reward sort of the standards, right? And so, from an open hardware perspective, you know that's an advantage for us. Um, and I think if that's you can get that feedback, it improves your product faster than it totally. does for someone who doesn't get that feedback. Exactly. Well, yeah. And, uh, to to your point, when you're doing something that's open source. I think you tend to put more care into it because you know you're going to be exposed. This I know this is true in software. I, I think it's true in, in hardware just as much. It keeps you in check. We say that a lot here, right? It keeps us it keeps us honest. Yeah. So. I mean, there is uh, something that uh, Carl mentioned earlier that uh, that at Little Bits we um, experienced a lot. So in the first few years, we were very very focused on making everything that we delivered. Uh, open source, it took an, an incredible amount of overhead, and especially since Littlebits is a large platform, there's over, you know, 80 bits, um, it it, uh, it adds a ton of overhead per bit. Uh, but at one point, we noticed that all the extra work, um, there was only a handful of people that were pulling, uh, that were looking at the documentation or, or looking at the, at the board. So we were doing all this extra work that was hundreds and hundreds of hours of people's time, uh, and really a very, very tiny community of people were looking at it. Um, and uh, arguably, uh, it wasn't uh, necessary. And so we had to deprioritize that because uh, as Glenn was saying, you are under pressure to deliver innovative products. You have to have timelines that you want to hit, particularly we were working on timelines of the school year or Christmas. And, uh, and so we had to make a difficult call to, uh, you know, the last third of the bits, we didn't do as much work on, on uh, opening them up. Um, so it's a, it, it was kind of a constant struggle. So it's interesting to hear you know, from, from all of you, uh, the drive that is, you know, um, Nadia saying scalability, resilience of the product, uh, um, uh, uh, Lenore saying that, you know, it makes you look at find uses that you didn't think about before. These are all real um, benefits that, that, that definitely counter some of the difficulty, but it is difficult for sure. Um, which brings me to one of the most difficult aspects of producing hardware for anybody, uh, but I think open hardware adds a layer of complexity, which is supply chain manufacturing. Um, I would love to hear about your supply chain nightmares. <laughs> Who has a, a supply chain nightmare to share uh, with the community? The reason I ask that question is I know that there are a lot of either uh, beginners or early um, uh, early uh, hardware developers in their career in the audience. And uh, and I, I, I really am a fan of people not thinking that they are doing something wrong and there's something wrong with them and for them to understand from everybody that uh, these are hard things for every for for any developer. Uh, so, you know, your supply chain nightmares, um, any volunteers? All of the uh, above. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, I could tell you one thing that it has forced us to do, and really, in this, it's almost like in the spirit of open source hardware, right? Um, it forced us to consider and think differently about our supply chain channels. Um, too easily, we we go to China's sort of the the solution, um, and it just forces us. It forced us to think in that you know towards the end of December, what are the other alternatives? You know, it's a big world out there. So it really, again, put us in check and sort of 
challenged our status quo. So if there's anything good that came out of it, at least from my perspective, it really forced the team to think differently about sort of supply chain management, and how we should look at it differently, whether it's normal course of business or if there's a second contingency plan we need to consider. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, supply has been, as we all know on this panel, it's, it's, it's been difficult. Um, yeah. But yeah, all these sourcing, sourcing uh, raw materials. Yeah, exactly. Um, anybody else? Any uh, manufacturing disaster, compliance disaster, fire on the line, uh, shipment stuck in in Tumbuktu? Yeah, I can, uh, I can share one for for certain, and one of many many different challenges. But um, in one of our components, we use rivnuts. It's a small nut that compresses against aluminum, and you can use it to put threads into uh, into aluminum. We, we like to use steel rivnets because aluminum is too soft, and so threads a lot of times will, will pull out. Well, uh, we order tens of thousands of these at a time, and and when they arrive, uh, we popped open the box, and everything was fine, and so we started using them, and we popped open the second box, and it was rusted. The third box was rusted. The fourth box was rusted. The fifth one was rusted. We learned that day that when you get a shipment, you open everything and inspect it. Uh, because uh, then you have to wait three weeks to get your new to get mm -hmm. new, yeah. new set, mm -hmm. and maybe that halts production. So, yeah, um, yeah uh, that, that was a tough That's lesson cool. learned. Not, not a fun, yeah. not a fun activity. Christina, you're nodding. Say yeah. something if you have a story. So, uh, with our first phone, before we even launched the Kickstarter campaign, you know, it was it was interesting because it was our first time and and we had reluctantly because it was just our tester that we had slapped together for our testers but then people started asking to buy it so it was actually a, a kit that we reformulated from seed studio and so we re, we ordered a couple hundred kits from seed studio in preparation and they got caught in customs in alaska for over a month and that was a huge wake-up call for us because we didn't we were helpless we didn't know why they had been caught we didn't know how long it was going to take for them to get out of you know limbo and we realized sorry probably shouting we realized that um we would have to carry the overhead of all of our employees during any delays so because of that we actually shifted to a more uh contractor model and uh, employed people on contractor uh, short-term basis to keep um, kind of our overhead down. And typically companies don't like to do that, especially if they're raising uh, revenue because you wanna show a large team and all of that kind of stuff. But for us, we just really had to work on a shoestring. So the second thing that, that, that forced us to do was, for example, for this second phone, we have most of our source is most of our inventory is available stateside. And we manufacture in Seattle. We um, do everything in Seattle. The only parts that we source from China uh, that are uh, inventory in China are the display and the battery. So um, those are the parts that we will have to wait for um, to assemble the phone. But in the meantime, we can assemble the whole board uh, and test all the units with the sample uh, displays and sample batteries. So yes, it it was really a good heads up for us that first year. And um, we've been developing our system since then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Getting some of those lessons early on is effective to kind of build resilience into your, your supply chain because they will invariably happen. The sooner you know, the better. Right. So, and also having backup components, you know, yeah. to be able to replace out and to make sure that um, and then that also help, helps with open source. Other people have uh, pointed this out as well. If you share out your board and somebody wants to swap out a part, it's, it's much easier yeah. if you yeah. don't have specialty parts. So we had a supplier not too long ago uh, helpfully substitute a stainless steel nut for a zinc plated nut because it was higher quality <laughs> and so we had to communicate much more clearly that no that actually had to be a zinc plated nut because of issues with its seizing and it was just they were like oh but you want the highest quality thing and so the the difficulty was in communicating the exact specifications rather than you know uh, some nebulous um i want the best thing with yeah. our suppliers. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been interesting working um, with learning uh, to communicate which things are important. 
Um, even with a supplier that you've worked with for years, you still have to keep in mind exactly which things are important to communicate about a particular part, even something as simple as a nut. Yeah. And that's another important part about the coronavirus occurring is that we've actually uh, been approached in the last month by a large, uh, I can't say their name, but large manufacturer of other phones uh, in America, um, of American phones. Um, and they're offering to make our phone in China. Uh, and of course, they are exceptional at doing that. But we won't be able to fly there to be boots on the ground to inspect any of the product uh, there and to make sure that it's, uh, you know, within our vision and within our uh, design and things like that. So it's really um, disabling this whole uh, global situation. Um, I would encourage people to, after this panel, jump on the Discord and share some of these stories. And if they've uh, come up with solutions that particularly are going to be relevant now, uh, during the coronavirus um, um, pandemic, um, uh, there will be people that potentially are in China that could help uh, when things ease up a bit. Um, there will be people that have found other solutions or have you know stocks of piles of materials that could help. And I think that there there'll be a lot of um, you know um, solutions within the community. So I would encourage people to go uh, to the Discord channel after that to discuss this. Um, and there is a, a COVID-19 specific Discord channel as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about, you know, kind of the, in thinking about the next 10 years, um, how if, you know, we want to continue growing open source hardware, we want to uh, bolster it, uh, make it stronger. Um, what are, you know, how we uh, understand and analyze some of the tools and enable, enablers that were really helpful in the past decade and the ones that we want to take forward. So uh, in, when I say tools and enablers, I mean things like design tools, I mean things like community, which was already touched upon, but I also mean uh, tools like media, uh, and I mean tools like um, institutions, uh, schools, libraries, um, uh, makerspaces. So um, I'll start, I guess, with, uh, with makerspaces because I think that's uh, relevant for a lot of people. Uh, what is the role that makerspaces play in this movement? And uh, Christina, you did a survey of makerspaces that have existed over the past 10 years. Give us a bit of a snapshot um, of what you found. So the reason I was doing the research was part of our Kickstarter campaign involved uh, flying to makerspaces throughout the United States and offering to teach people how to assemble the circle phone uh, in class um, form. And we did offer to ship circle phone uh, components and people could assemble them by themselves, but they preferred to have the class along with it. And um, so I had to do research uh, about which makerspaces we were, which six makerspaces we were going to go to uh, through the, throughout the United States. And it turned out there were, um, so I based that on uh, the states that had the most makerspaces. And so I contacted the makerspaces, for example, in California, Texas, New York. Um, there, there were um, also Austin, not Austin, excuse me. Um, I'll, I'll think of it. Anyways, um, what I found was uh, when I would start, so I was working off of a list provided by Maker Media, um, and the list seemed to have been two years old at that time, but it was the only list I could find at that time. So I started contacting all of the makerspaces uh, in those states to figure out which one ones would be open to be participating, uh, having their name on our uh, Kickstarter campaign. And uh, what I found was about 18% of the kick, of the makerspaces had gone down um, by the time that I contacted them. So I got the sense that, that the list was about two years old. So it seemed like, um, you know, any makerspace after it was established really had about an 80% chance of, of um, surviving after it was established. But um, I think it's a really hard. I think makerspaces are an act of love. I think that, and I've talked about this before, but you know, when libraries were first established, they used to be a privilege of the rich, and then they became a public uh, foundation. But I think we're seeing makerspaces move 
uh, from private makerspaces to more public makerspaces. For example, the makerspaces that have been incorporated in places uh, um, in libraries. I, I believe uh, the Los Angeles Library was the first one to do this, but there have been a lot of makerspaces that have popped up in libraries since then. And I think it's a great transition for libraries nowadays to uh, move to the kind of more hardware digital um, uh, format of sharing uh, because uh, fewer and fewer people are reading paper books. Um, Gosh, I hope that never goes away. Um, but uh, I think it's a great transition. Uh, Christina, would you be willing to share your list of makerspaces that you found, the ones that are still active? Um, I think that'd be a really useful list for people. Oh, uh, yes, but I did that in 2016. There are actually better lists of makerspaces out now, and I'm happy to share those lists as yeah. well. So. Yeah, I think it would be great. Um, uh, Lenore, we talked about uh, libraries. Um, you, you work with libraries quite a bit. Uh, you work with schools quite a bit. Uh, what is the role that schools and libraries play in growing the open hardware movement? And what do we need to do to help them? That's interesting. I think it, that the relationship is kind of reversed, that the schools and libraries benefit from the open hardware movement when we create tools that they can use for education. Um, so, for instance, if you make a low-cost soldering kit that um, they can use for teaching soldering, that they can buy en masse, um, uh, you know, they're going to uh, take advantage of that, um, kind of whether it's open source or not, but it's usually more beneficial if it's open source for the reasons that we talked about earlier, that the documentation uh, tends, we hope, is better um, and, you know, that so much thought has been put into it. Um, and then from a tools perspective, um, more and more makerspaces are getting things like 3D printers um, and other digital fabrication tools, uh, like yeah, even pen plotters, uh, vinyl cutters, those kinds of things. And the more open they are, the more the libraries and makerspaces can maintain them um, because your, uh, your costs are, uh, limited or your, you know, funds are limited for these kinds of things, typically in these types of institutions, um, because you're usually in, uh, you know, resource restricted, um, situations. So the open source hardware projects tend to be a good fit for those environments in part because we can make them last longer because they have a community around them because they can look it up online and see how somebody else resolved the problem that they're seeing now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Nadia, you did uh, quite a bit of research on open source manufacturing. That's also obviously a big um, enabler or component that I think is going to be important in the whole movement. Um, can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, I don't know exactly how to characterize it well, but I guess maybe a difference between me and the other people on this panel are I don't ship product. I just like galley van around in the magical world of academia. Um, and so the uh, uh, one of the things that I think is really interesting to explore is what would it mean to not have manufacturers? What At what point do we have enough documentation, enough source that everyone can make everything on, the, on their own? And I don't mean that in like a hypothetical everyone where everyone is no one, but really what does it take for people who aren't experts who don't necessarily have training in production to be able to buy parts on a list and assemble machines, tools, and other kinds of things. Um, and there, I think uh, a lot of the time, what we rely on is the historical, you know, we rely on the historical way that things have been made in the past. Um, and then we try to kind of shrink it or make it into something that fits in a makerspace. And fundamentally, I think there's something really broken about that, about how changing, um, just making infrastructure like cheaper or, um, or, or somehow easier to get into a space doesn't necessarily make it easy to use or well suited to the people who are going to have access to it. Um, so I like to think about, you know, what is the fabricatability of this thing? What is the, what are the, what are the tools you need to make it? What is the expertise you need to make it? How can people get that expertise? How can people get the parts? Um, and that's, I think, an, a, an interesting starting point for you know, what distributed manufacturing, open manufacturing would really look like. Um, 
I, yeah, I don't know. I have a lot, I feel like I'll hijack the panel if I talk about this for too long. I mean, it's an interesting breakout. It's an interesting other conversation. If people are interested, definitely um, should uh, this conversation should continue on, on the Discord channel. Uh, Carl and Glenn, both of you manufacture in the US. Carl, you guys manufacture uh, computers. Glenn, um, you guys manufacture all sorts of small and large hardware. Um, uh, what are the, some of the tools that have changed over time um, that have enabled design tools or production tools, manufacturing tools that have changed uh, over the past decade um, that you think are going to be enablers for the open hardware movement? That's a tricky um, question. That it is. <laughs> because we, we, so our company's been grown organically. We started in my basement 15 years ago. We can't uh, really hear. Oh, it, uh, my company's been, Susan Jane Six has been grown organically over 15 years. It started in my basement there, you know, from essentially nothing. And we didn't jump into manufacturing until we had the capital to buy the type of machinery that was necessary to do it. And so that's uh, that's where I struggle as well. When, one idea of just listening to the panel was um, potentially partnering with universities that have a lot of this machinery so that at least people can gain the expertise to, to manufacture products. Um, and, and it's a lot different than just. Well, I feel like we, can, we, can we just spend of like one thing? Makerspaces aren't just like a bunch of tools. Makerspaces are people with expertise that help other people do stuff. Mm -hmm. And being like, oh, you know, universities have tools worked in a lot of universities and a lot of times it's just like a pile of rust it doesn't work it doesn't help to have to say oh you know some rich person donated a bunch of this stuff and now everyone has access to it it's really not true if the tools aren't usable if they're not designed for lots of novices to come and do different kinds of stuff then um having a maker space is like meaningless yeah, a couple of years ago i went to metro here before we started manufacturing um, because they have a program for um, machinists and and other um, uh, you know other folks that are that are interested in this type of manufacturing work, and so they had lasers, they had lathes, they had um, they had the machinery, and I actually I learned a lot there as well because we were just learning how to manufacture, and so uh, you know I don't have you know the answer to to make this more accessible, but um, you know perhaps finding those places where they're available, and then those of us that are doing manufacturing, um, some of the guys here and, and folks here. Have have uh, talked about potentially having classes uh, to bring people in and uh, show them what what's about it if there's interest in, in manufacturing or yeah or but i think that they're also like the educational pipeline thing is a little bit of a you know it's not about learning to use the tools that already exist plenty of these tools suck like we all still use g-code why <laughs> it's a it's like a it's like a two-way street. Yes, we want more people who can do stuff with these tools, but at the same time, you know, we are now in the position where we can change all of these tools. So doing more of that, I think, is also a great way to start chipping away at this problem. But are you saying, Nadia, we need more? You're saying we need to improve the tools or we need other tools? I think both, all of the above. And also, I think we really need to celebrate the people who are doing the maintenance and the education and making that a really valuable component of it. I think, you know, one thing, I've been involved in a lot of makerspaces for a long time, and like makerspace manager burnout is a real thing. <laughs> it's uh, the, the ones that just like fold or go away, or like you come back a few years later and everything is just broke and hasn't been used for a while. Like, what do we do about that? Yeah, but I would argue that's not a tool problem. That's a that's a, a supporting the community. Uh, but I think it, ha it has to do. It does have to do with the tool, I think, because if you are requiring right now, we're requiring people who use makerspace tools to effectively do a miniaturized version of exactly the same CNC workflow that people did in the 1960s. And so we, we've come a long way in making things really usable. We can have like toddlers using iPads. So why are they not using robot arms? So, so one of the success stories, I think, in um, uh, design tools is uh, KiCad, that um, they've had increased development, significant tool improvement, and education. They have people publishing tutorials and footprint libraries and all of those things where uh, suddenly you really can learn to do EDA, but 
it's still <laughs> it still has its roots in those 60s design practices, but it's getting better. And, and it is more accessible because those communities have come together and are doing the education as well as the development. Mm -hmm. um, Glenn, any thoughts on? It, yeah, I mean, this is clearly a difficult discussion, right? I think in the spirit of what we want to do, what we want to bring to the community, we, we want to provide that availability, we want to provide the tool sets. But quite candidly, what it comes down to is how do we model this in such a way that it could maintain itself, frankly, from a financial perspective, right? Um, we do what we can from a spark fund perspective to reach out to the community and build things. And we've done it in terms of, you know, an idea, we bring it to the spark fund store and we sell it. But I think in a broader sense, um, from a community perspective, what is the right model, right? How do we, how do we get to that point? Um, and I, you know, this, like th there's, there's a point from a business perspective, spark has been in business for, oh my gosh, 17 years now. Um, and so there's this challenge of keeping the lights on, but contributing to community in a bigger part of fashion. And what does that balance look like? Quite candidly, I don't know. Uh, we've tried so many different things. And um, Nadia, to your point, it's not just giving access and giving the tool sets. It's how do you enable them? How do you educate them? Um, and that requires time and effort. Um, and quite candidly, schools are also a challenge for us, right? We want to be in that space. We are in that space. But it, there's also a lot of heavy lift in terms of the educational training, then getting up to speed on what, you know, what, what, what is an Arduino. And so we have feet on the street, but that, that's a big heavy lift for, for a lot of organizations. Um, and we'll continue to sort of push that forward. But as a community, as business leaders, we need to think about what, the, what, what does the right model look like? And what does that balanced model look like that benefits everyone? Um, it's, not, it's, it's a difficult topic. And I just wanted to give a shout out to Spark Fund. Thank you for bringing all of your cellular boards online in the last year. I've really noticed and really appreciated it. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, the, these things are important to say because I, I definitely relate to what Glenn is saying. It's, it's a lot of extra work, a lot of extra overhead when you're running a company. Uh, on one hand, um, you're trying to take care of your employees, making sure that everybody is happy, well paid, and do, doing interesting work. You have to take care of investors or people that have funded the company. Uh, you have to make sure the company can stand on its feet and be, uh, uh, be sustainable. Uh, you also want to take care of the customer, give them something at a price that they are willing to pay and not more. You want to take care uh, of the, um, the, the early adopters or the, the one percenters that uh, want, are never happy with how things work. It's a difficult balance to, to bring everything together. Uh, and so many times you don't have time to kind of reinvent the tool chain uh, and have to use what's around. And it ends up being subpar for everybody, but it's sort of, you know, maybe you have to Oh no! Well, I want to build on what Io was saying that um, uh, the documentation part of it and the education part of it is super important. But one of the ways that we started as a company was actually not as a company, but as a project blog. We started by telling people how to do things, and so that's been one of the the reasons that open hardware was a good fit for us is because we started from that perspective of let's show people how to do things. Yep. And so some of the things that we sell the most of are gumdrop LEDs and pager motors, which neither of which are particularly open source, they're just components. Um, but because we make them accessible and we describe them in a way that um, uh, teachers find friendly you know, they are, they'll are buy it from us because they can understand how to use it because of the ways that we describe it. And that's one of the ways that we solve that problem of connecting with the classrooms is, in, is trying to have really inclusive language in all of our documentation. And we fail at that sometimes. Some of our documentation is probably um, too technical or um, less inviting than it could be, um, but, but we do sell a lot of gumdrop LEDs. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left. I want to take some questions from the audience, but I do, uh, I, I would be remiss to leave a topic um, unspoken about in this panel, uh, which is um, Make Magazine and Maker Media. Uh, obviously, Make Magazine and Maker Media was a very big uh, proponent, evangelist, and kind of um, 
pillar uh, in, in propping up the open hardware movement and supporting many of our uh, businesses, projects, um, academic research. Um, what has the, the um, dissolution of maker media uh, meant to the movement? Um, it's propped up in different forms now, so it's more community driven uh, and, and there's great work being done on that front. But what, what does it being gone mean and what will it mean for the future? So one of the things that I've noticed is that we don't have as many in-person, and this is exacerbated, of course, by uh, the current situation, in-person opportunities to connect with other people like ourselves. So Maker Faire, although I loved the um, interaction with the public, was more important to me as a way to uh, connect with um, people like me who are making kits for that community. And, and so that's the thing that I miss the most. The things that are gone that I think are less um, tragic, we're going away anyway. Um, so Metro okay. Magazine as a, um, as a hub for, place, for a place to people, for people to go and get information, well, there aren't those hubs anymore. Um, you know, there are Facebooks and there are Twitters and there are Instagrams, um, but there aren't uh, the same kinds of blog hubs and um, central sources of information. Our community is much, much more distributed. And that coincided with Maker Media's fall. Um, I don't know how much it contributed to it, but so I think that's less of a loss now because it was going away anyway. What are other people's comments on that? Nadia, you look like you have some thoughts. Oh, you're muted, I think. Hi. We can't hear you. No. Who can read sign language? That's not really <laughs> sign language. Um, anybody else, thoughts on, on uh, Maker Media? As far as the Maker Faire is going away, I really miss uh, like Lenore pointed out, the water cooler talks, just the casual conversations that you would have in person with people, you know, for example, saying, oh, um, I no longer use threaded inserts in my prints because, you know, I found that the 2.5, you know, millimeter screw works just fine for the limited number of times that I need to, you know, um, screw and unscrew it and things like that. I mean, those things, uh, you may not uh, say in, for example, if you're giving a talk, but uh, just those casual conversations really meant a lot to me. Yeah. Um, I mean, the software community in some sense never had that and never seemed to need it. So I guess maybe it's a challenge for the hardware community to try to figure out how to use software in the web in a more efficient way to make those things happen. Incredible, uh, huge pieces of software have been written with people that I've never met before, never been able to have water cooler talks, never been able to share anything in person. So I think, um, I think, yeah, you know, uh, there's many other reasons I, uh, I'm very, very, um, sad about Maker Media um, and Maker Faire not being around, but I do hope that they come in a different form and, and they seem to have kind of started that. Um, That's um, the thing that, you know, oh, not take. Not. Make Media was deeply problematic in a bunch of different ways, and there are a bunch of other people that are doing a better job. Um, there's like More a lot of, people. I don't know, there's a Adafruit and SparkFun have like lots of educational resources. Hackaday Supercon is an awesome con. Teardown is awesome, the Crowd Supply one. Uh, mm -hmm. There's like Murph, Earth, Murph, all the Earth, all of those. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I don't know. I was getting kind of tired of being accosted by giant cupcakes. <laughs> um, all right. So on that note, on cupcake note, let's take some questions from the audience. So there's a few that um, were picked out for us um, that I'm going to tackle. Uh, one simple one. Let's try to keep those super short so we can take a few. Um, one simple one, how long should the team continue to support a piece of open hardware after they discontinue it? Uh, maybe I'll talk, you know, ask Glenn and Carl, mm -hmm. um, um, Christina, every, and actually everybody, please. Anybody who has mm -hmm. an, uh, an answer, feel free to jump in. I think the typical length of time is five years. Um, uh, and in business, at least, um, uh, in 
selling products three years is the typical warranty that you need to support up to and and most companies move to five years five years we just got a tech support request yesterday for a product that we launched in 2008 and have just haven't really discontinued but haven't updated in five years so Mm -hmm. we're still supporting it but it's low volume so we've never really stopped supporting (laughs) uh pretty much anything (laughs) yeah (laughs) it's only from a smartphone perspective it's very very reactive puts put something EOL. <laughs> we have stuff that Nate came up with, you know, 15 years ago that's still out there. I think so long as yeah. there's demand, we'll have it out there. Um, so, I mean, that's, you know, we do have an advantage from from a manufacturing perspective that everything's in-house. So we can manage sort of the cost overhead appropriately. Um, and yeah, we, we could support older products so long as we continue to come up with newer products that could help feed the engine as well, right? If we get to a position where we just cast cow older products, then then we're out of business tomorrow. But um, but from a Sparfum perspective, we, we tend to hold on to things much much longer, frankly, than I would like in some cases, but I get why we do it, so. That makes sense. And for me, I try to just follow what other people have demonstrated. So one of the first phones that I cut my teeth on was David Mellis's 2012 uh, phone. And he was still supporting that, you know, years later. And so I, uh, you know, I really watch what other people do. And so it makes me kind of wonder like how long we need to support and maybe we need to, uh, for example, for our phones, you know, set expectations up front. You know, we will support this for two years uh, because it's a large undertaking and we have limited staff. So yeah, there's also a distinction between um, technical support and hardware replacement or RMAs. Mm. Mm-hmm. I think for technical support, we offer lifetime support. So until the thing just dies, you can call us and talk to us. But um, the ability to to com- replace components inside of the, the computer um, is, in, in our case, somewhat limited by the upstream warranties that we are you know, beholden to from memory suppliers and so forth. Um, that being said, when things do run out, or I think a good policy to have is that if um, is that you you replace something um, that's broken um, under warranty uh, with equivalent or better. And so sometimes you can't buy the same memory or replace memory for a customer exactly, but um, it, by replacing it with equivalent or better is a good practice. Yeah, and uh, last comment on this from a Sparkling perspective, we also benefit from the fact that we're not we're not tied to a funnel end use product, right? We, we go to mark with all the puzzle pieces that people need to make something. And mm-hmm. sometimes those mm-hmm. puzzle pieces last 15, 20 years and we're actually okay with that, so. Um, so it sounds like we have a, 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 a we have five extra minutes, so we can keep going with a few other questions. Um, the, I think this question is pretty important. Um, on the topic of compliance, what are you experiencing with gaining certifications? CE, UL, FCC, uh, on commercial open hardware. If I was on the panelist side, I would talk about this for seventy five hours because making. Uh, open source hardware products for kids that are exposed circuit boards that are for education and have magnets in them are probably the worst Venn diagram anybody <laughs> can ever embark on in the world and also have white circuit boards. So um, I'm not going to speak because I would hog the conversation, but please, um, whoever has experience, I think CE is really important, CE and UL, FCZ, of course. Um, any sort of feedback on um, how to get these certifications and how to make them easier for people that are getting started? <laughs> it's Where do I start? Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for us, uh, it's it's kind of frustrating for us because we source all of our inventory from the United States. We uh, manufacture in the United States, and yet the most cost effective and most uh, knowledgeable solution in these certifications are actually in China. So we will have to send test units to China to get certified for America, which just blows my mind. There are excellent certification companies in California, uh, but uh, they cost an arm and a leg and we can't afford them at this point. So it's just easier for us to send our units uh, to China to get certified at this point. So I actually, uh, I'm, I mean, I, I wasn't kidding. I do have quite a bit of experience with that, um, but we do have, uh, we had some excellent relationships with uh, people in the US that did certifications. We actually had a little bit of team member that recently started uh, his own shops to do that for companies. 
if people oh. are interested, get in touch with me and I will um, okay. introduce you. Uh, he's just an incredible person and has so much knowledge and has so many contacts both in the US and abroad and can really help on that front. But it's painful, painful process. Fantastic, thank you. Um, all right, uh, another question uh, that I think is, um, is important. Um, is releasing source file, design file, bomb, and backend code enough? Or uh, does really being open, good open hardware maker require very extensive documentation and dev tools? Documentation is definitely required as part of the open hardware definition. Um, but I think that doing a good job of that is definitely required. And that I think a lot of people don't even even to some extent, figuring out what kind of documentation we can write so people can replicate and build upon our work is something, I don't know, I'll just call myself out. I don't always do the best job of, but I do think it's very, very, very important. Yeah. It, it's hard for someone who makes hardware to know what information someone who doesn't make hardware needs to be able to replicate your project. We're too close to it. So it's hard for us to see what documentation is required unless we're doing the kind of documentation internally um, to uh, enable our own production to be really good. So that's kind of unusual um, for, so I think many of us are, are so close that it makes it hard, but yes. Yeah, I'm actually doing a project on this right now where we have this multi-headed, this multi-headed machine where it picks up and drops off different tools called Jubilee. Um, and there we're actually doing a research project where we're testing the documentation. We're like figuring out what are the attributes of documentation of electromechanical devices that is important for people to be able to replicate them if they had access to um, the kinds of tools you might find in a makerspace. Um, I will look right. forward to that research coming out. <laughs> Conclusions are you need a lot of documentation. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots. Um, it's fun. Don't deter people. We're trying to encourage people. Um, all right. Um, next question. Um, sometimes open source means building a smaller business than your investors or customers or colleagues wish it could be. How do you avoid the temptation to scale your company past the point where it may be impractical, impractical to best cater to open source minded customers? I think uh, the way I understand the question is um, if you uh, if you have investors, there's pressure to not be open source or, or customers want a certain level of um, of delivery or product that being open source be makes difficult in terms of kind of out of box experience or UX or things like that uh, or colleagues, same thing. Is it really um, a decision between scaling the company and being open source? Um, or uh, do you have to resist temptation to scale uh, because it becomes impractic impractical to be open source? I think you have scale issues regardless if you're open source or not, honestly. And I think you know the same business challenge you have in a closed source model, and open, they're all the same. I think from my perspective, open source just teases it out or, or again, keeps you in check a lot sooner. And so from an investor perspective, I, I, I don't know how to answer that because we're, we're totally bootstrapped here at SparkFun. Uh, but I will often get asked the question, again, having worked at Arrow for over 20 years, how is it running an open source hardware company versus something like Arrow? And frankly, the answer is really not that different. We all have the same challenges, cash flow, working capital, inventory turns, product releases. Um, it's, we just have to do it fast because of our model. Um, and I also think people need to keep in mind, what, what market are you entering from an open source hardware perspective? It works for us because, again, we, we focus on the building blocks or we, fo we focus on the puzzle pieces. Um, candidly, that might be a different discussion if you're, if you're looking at it from an end user and user perspective. Um, I am sure you probably have some, some challenges there. And those challenges will be different than Spark Plums because, again, um, we're focused more on, on, on the bits and pieces versus the final product. But I, I honestly think it's, it's an easy out for most folks to say, you know, it's just harder for open source art. Honestly, I think it, they're all the same challenges. I think I would I would tend to agree. I think the challenges are the same. What I would say, um, what I would say to people is, if you are going to open source your product, just make sure that your um, your uh, offering is not a commodity. That's exactly right. Your offering is a commodity, and uh, your board can be replicated, and that's what you're offering people. That's not enough. The Definitely. reason Adafruit and SparkFun succeed in what they're doing is because their value add 
is in the tutorials and the videos and the uh, uh, in the speed at which they create them and things like that. It's not just replicating the hardware does not replicate the product that they've received. You, you summed um, up perfectly and, I, and I'll yeah. set up after this, but it, to your point, it really is the value beyond the product you're selling, right? And yeah. the thing I would encourage people to do, especially startups is, you know, as you sort of identify what that value is for your product, understand that changes over time. That value becomes expected, right? So, you know, you need to think about what the next thing is in terms of what you wrap around that product set that, that creates value for your customer. Um, but if, it, if you're just looking at it from a pure product perspective, it's, it's not, regardless if you're open source or, or closed source, it, it's still a challenge to figure out what the value is. Um. All right, uh, so one last question to leave this hopefully on a positive note. Um, if you could start your journey again, knowing what you know now, what would you do differently? Um, question for everybody in the panel. Well, I can tell you one mistake we've made. Um, although this has much more to do with manufacturing than it does with open source hardware, unfortunately, but one mistake we made was um, is going cheap on some of the machinery that we purchased or trying to, and then we found that, that that failed miserably and it ended up costing more. So um, when it comes to producing your products, the things that you're making, um, make the investment in good, in good machinery. Don't be cheap. Yeah. All right. Another um, comment. What, if, if, you, if you started your journey again, knowing what you know now, what would you do differently? I think maybe being less shy about learning things. I think it's really, mm -hmm. especially now I think it's an e maybe an easier landscape to say something like that, where you're like, oh, I'm on YouTube. I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, but I do actually think a lot of people learn that way and that uh, maybe in the beginning being like shy or um, embarrassed about your own skill set, maybe if I could go back in time, I would be like, it's okay, Nadia. You can talk to the internet. They probably won't eat you. <laughs> <laughs> or if they did, you don't care. Not yeah. Care. yeah, it'll be fine. Yeah. Others? Honestly, if I knew everything that I would have to go through at this point, I never would have started. <laughs> it's been absolutely brutal. And uh, thankfully, I had no idea. Um, you know, I thought, how hard could it be to make a cell phone, to make a smartphone? You know, surely I can, I can do this. Um, I had no idea idea about supply issues and uh, how difficult it is to get the attention of some suppliers if you're a small company, and uh, also just being taken seriously. You know, being a small company, you know, trying to achieve a very complex product, and uh, that's all been an uphill battle. But um, wow, I really, I really love my job, though. <laughs> so. So the tip is don't ask too many questions before you start. <laughs> exactly. Don't ask too many questions. Just be It'll super be fine. curious. Go. It'll yeah. be fine. And then also, you know, when you have a deadline approaching, you're like, I have to ask this stupid question. I have a deadline approaching. I have to ship product right now. So, um, you know, it, it forces you into uncomfortable situations that you would normally not ever venture into. And because of that, you know, you, you grow a tough skin and you become really brave and you're not afraid to ask, you know, the stupid question or, or uh, be naive about something. You know, say, I have to ship tomorrow, so please can you explain this technical detail to me that, you know, everybody assumes that I should know already, you know, kind of thing. So. I think that's really the, the thing is that if I had been much more forthright about asking questions, that could have made things easier. I don't know if I would have started a business. It's so much work. <laughs> but um, but that uh, knowing how generous this community is and how willing they are to ask questions, I, I'm if I had known that then, maybe I would have asked more. Maybe I would have learned faster because I would have been more uh, willing to ask the question. So that's a good takeaway is that this community is really generous. Mm -hmm. If you're in the, in the channels and asking questions, you're probably gonna get really good information. Um, so reach out. All, there are so many experts and people who aren't experts but are willing to help you research things or ask what, or answer what they know. So. I would have also um, never learned to, to solder with leaded solder. Useless skill to be good at. 
Be gone, let it solder. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I think um, that that was a really uh, nice tip for everybody. Um, don't um, don't hesitate to ask questions. The uh, community is very generous. Don't be shy. Um, I would like to use uh, my soapbox for a minute uh, to say something that is very kind of important for me that I think has always been very important for this open hearted community um, that I did know when I started, but I think is even more important today than when I did start, which is uh, design an inclusive environment um, from when you start your company, your team, uh, your uh, discussion group, your forum, whatever it is you're designing, design it to be inclusive from day one. That means inclusive to people from different ethnicities, different genders, uh, different uh, technical backgrounds, um, <laughs> different languages, uh, because it gets very, very hard afterwards if you don't do that. And it is ex also extremely important, even more so this day and age. So uh, end of soapbox. Thank you, everybody, for uh, being on this panel. Thank uh, you, Aya. Please chat on the Discord afterwards. Um, uh, we were thrilled to have you and have a great rest of the day. Thanks, guys. Cheers.